Hey there, welcome to Solid Ground Church. If you're new around here, my name is Mike, and I'm so glad that you have joined us today. And a special happy Mother's Day to any moms that are watching. I know my mom's watching. Hi, mommy, your little guy loves you. Don't tell anyone I said your little guy on here, so it's just our secret. But um, today we're going to be talking about getting our peace back and fighting the devil. So get buckle up. It's about to get fun here today. And uh, before we jump into our worship songs, I just wanted to remind you that if you live in the Southern California area, anywhere close to Rancho Cucamonga, we're gonna have tacos after church on May 15th. It's going to be delicious. It's springtime, bring a baseball glove. But most of all, uh, bring your appetite because Juan's Tacos is absolutely delicious. So we would love for you and your whole family to join us for a really fun day of family fun and fellowship. Speaking of family fun and fellowship, we're really packing it in here in May. We'd love if you would join us for this great, great fundraiser and organization that we work with. They put on uh, every year and it has the most delicious food. I mentioned last week, I'll have barbecue all, sauce all over my face. It has delicious coffee. Please join us for the annual Southern California Festival and Sale. Information about that is on sgbic.com and we would love to see you there. And before we, before we get to our worship songs, I just wanted to thank all of you that give regularly to Solid Ground Church. Uh, before we uh, are doing these announcements, I was in a chapel with Alta Loma Christian School. It's one of the ministries of our church. And I, I, I was listening to all of these young people sing their, their, their little hearts out in worship to God. And my heart was just, I was, I was over the moon. And I was also reaching for earplugs because they're very loud. But I kept thinking about just the beauty of being a part of a church that we are discipling. We have over 300 students and we're, uh, we're discipling them every single day. We care about academics and, and athletics and all those schooly type things. But I was thinking about the mission of our school is so much different. We're not trying to be a better version of public school. Like we are discipling young people and their families. And when you give regularly to Solid Ground Church, you make things like that happen. You allow us to minister way beyond the walls of our church. And if you're new around here, please feel no pressure, obligation to give. You're just checking things out. But if you consider Solid Ground Church your home, uh, the quickest and easiest way to give is on our website or in our give boxes here locally or, or dropping your gift by the church. But uh, for us, it's a response to all that Jesus has done for us. And we put it in our worship experience to frame it that way. It's not an obligation. It's not a tip. It's just a response uh, from, from our hearts saying thank you to God. And it's also a way to invest in furthering God's kingdom. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are trusting that you are going to speak to us today. We, uh, we ask that you would open our hearts and open our ears to hear your voice calling our names and that you will be there to save us uh, today and encourage us and pour in your spirit into our hearts and minds today. We give you this time. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All my words fall short I've got nothing how could I express all my gratitude? I could sing these songs as I often do, but every song must end, and you never do. So I throw up my
Don't you get shy on me, lift up your song Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs Get up and praise the Lord Oh, come on, my soul Oh, don't you get shy on me, lift up your song Cause you've got
In August of 2005, my dream came true. I want to tell you about the second Wednesday of August in 2005, where I began my dream job at the tender age of 26 years old. Oh my goodness, you guys. It was my first night to be a youth pastor to middle school students in a new city, a new state, in Austin, Texas. Oh my goodness. I had arrived. This had been my dream for four years, and I'd gone to Bible school, I'd been a missionary, I'd volunteered, but this was the first time I actually had a title connected to my full-time job. It was what I considered my first grown-up job instead of just random jobs here and there. And oh, I was I was so ready for this night. And we'd been in, in the city for a couple days and I'd observed at work, uh, been to work a couple days and met people in the office and stuff. And it came time for the first Wednesday night service. And I had a message prepared and all of that, but this moment came where my supervisor walked me into a chapel that had 250 middle school students crammed in there. And he goes, okay, Mike, they're all yours now. Slaps me on the back and he just left. I didn't know, I didn't know if there was a band, I didn't know programming wise. I was just left in a room with 250 middle school students. It felt like someone said, hey Mike, here's a steak necklace. Have fun swimming with some sharks. And needless to say, that night did not go well. There was no introduction. There was no, uh, I didn't know who was a volunteer and who was a random person. It was very, very disorienting. And what's worse, the kids didn't even know who I was. And they were much different than the kids. Obviously, in Japan, culturally, they were different from the kids in Tulsa that, that I had ministered to before that. Some of these kids were swearing at me. Who the blank are you? I'm like, well, I'm your new youth pastor. <laughs> and don't talk to me like that. That night, I felt so low. It's like, what, what in the world did I get my, myself into? But I, I, I don't give up easily. I was like, all right, let's, let's try it again. And in, in that cycle, I, had to preach a, I got to preach a sermon Wednesday night and Saturday night, and twice on Sunday, but it seemed like it was so hard to connect with these kids. And that Wednesday night began a cycle in my life of almost a year of quitting my job four times a week. I would quit after church on Wednesday night, I would quit after church on Sunday night, and definitely after Sunday morning service on the inside. I was still young, but luckily I had the, the, the smarts to, to not say it out loud because they may have taken me up on my offer if I had said something to my boss. But I, guys, I tried all of my best material. I, it, I wasn't failing in these services and, and in my duties because I wasn't trying. I was studying the scriptures harder. I was learning from everyone in the field. But after every service, I would get depressed. And not just like a little down, like these negative thoughts 
went way beyond my performance. Like I would go home thinking I'm worthless as a person, I'm failure. These thoughts were more than just thoughts. I was more than just grumpy and my sweet, wonderful Marie. Like obviously she noticed and she'd notice every, she would say every time you come in to the room or, or we meet after service, it's like there's this giant cloud around you and it takes you a good, uh, a good 12 hours or at least a good night's sleep to get over it. Thank goodness for never quitting on Wednesday night, Saturday night, or Sunday morning. But after, after months of this, it, no joke, it was almost a year of the same cycle and getting into the same downward pit I would fall in a couple, times a, a couple times a week. My wife asked me, Mike, what do you expect at a middle school service? What do you expect the service to be like? And Mike, what do you expect the middle schoolers to respond like? What, what, what's the image in your head? And it was the first time in almost a year that, that I bumped up against reality. Because when she said that, my imagination went wild. What do I expect middle schoolers to, to be like in one of my services after hearing me preach? Well, I expect 13-year-olds to leave in sackcloth and ashes, ripping their clothes in repentance, uh, coming to the altar in groves. I, I expected lines of teenagers just lining up so I could touch them and they would fall over like a televangelist. Like, that's realistic, right? I, I expected this to be the start of a big, this is so embarrassing to say, this, I expected it to be a start of a huge international ministry with yours truly in charge. You know, nothing too crazy, just an international ministry, just, just teenagers all of a sudden uh, becoming fully formed Jesus followers after a 25 minute talk. Like that night, Marie's question helped me uh, see the world in a completely different way. And it was gentle, but it was strong at the same time. It pushed me towards work I needed to do in my own life. And, and it also exposed lies that I was believing about myself. It exposed lies I, I was believing about how, how I could perform and even lies about my motivations for being in ministry. And it was so sneaky I wanted to help people, yes, but up to that point, I was completely blind to my pride, my ambition, and this happens to us, maybe in a different way, in a different context, but that night, I experienced what Jesus talked about in John 8, 32, when he says, then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Examining my expectations in the presence of, obviously, Jesus, but in the presence of my wife that loved me so much, it felt like unloading a burden. And Jesus was saying to me, whispering into my heart, I was waiting for you to, to bump up against that and to figure out that stuff was in your heart. I, I, I've been waiting for the moment where you saw that your talent, you've already come to the end of your talent, and now you have to depend on me. And it wasn't, it wasn't this experience of, of feeling down or embarrassed or shame. It was, more, it was more like unloading something that was really heavy and I was so stinking tired of carrying it around. And what's awesome is it wasn't a, a switch that flipped. It didn't automatically snap me into emotional health, but it was a pivotal moment for sure. It was a, a pivotal moment for me as a pastor, but more importantly, as a person, when I could see the world more clearly and have, have a better perspective on, on what life was like. And I realized all of these expectations, all of these things, uh, aspects of my job that, that, that were growing into an unhealthy concept of who I was, they were, that's what my identity was wrapped in. And none of those things I was believing about myself, my performance, none of those things were true. It was like I was navigating through life with a map that was upside down and mislabeled. I would get somewhere thinking this is when I've really arrived. For instance, I've really arrived when I get the title pastor. No, that was the start, that's not the arrival. Is it a good thing? Absolutely. 
But if you think that's the arrival, no way. Once I get that job, that recognition from people, once I, once I have some security, then I can just put things in autopilot, cruise control, and then things will be easy. No, no, my map wasn't right. And in that moment, though I couldn't read the true map completely, it was like God reoriented me, showed me where north was, and the streets were labeled, and I saw that I was on a journey. I hadn't arrived yet. I was just starting out. And in that moment was my baby step towards my expectations matching up with reality. That first moment where my identity started to to shift from what I did and what people said about me to what Jesus said about me. Maybe you've had one of those moments like I had where you bump into the truth. And, And a good way to know that you're bumping into the truth is it's empowering. Yes, there's an acknowledgement. You've got work to do. We've all got work to do. We never arrive. But when you bump into the truth, it's liberating. You feel free. You feel lighter. So hopefully all of us have this type of experience eventually when we're believing these lies. The lies, you fill in the blank. I'm not blank enough. The lie that said if you just had fill in the blank, I'd then I'd be happy. Or the lie that said if this blank situation changed, then all, then all my problems would be solved. Then I'll be good. And you can come up with your own lies that, that you're tempted to believe over and over. Those lies are not a good way to navigate through life because they're lies. They'll disorient your thoughts. They'll disorient your passions. They'll disorient your identity. And that's a map that will lead you and me to destruction. We have to orient ourselves to the truth. And guys, whether you know it or not, you are in a real battle. In the church, we we talk about spiritual warfare, and it looks different than you think. On, On one hand, when I say the word spiritual warfare, maybe you have images of the Lord of the Rings movies with the orcs and, and Gandalf like rushing towards each other. Or you, you get images in your mind of, of the trenches in World War I with mortars going off all over the place and rifles and bayonets. The, the battle looks a lot different. Or maybe you think, uh, when you hear spiritual warfare, you think uh, you're on the way to church and, and you get in an argument, and as soon as you get out of the car, you switch from, I can't believe you said that to, good morning, brother, good morning, sister, oh, I'm fine, thank you. Or, or, or spiritual warfare um, looking like, like it's an actual like, prize fight or something. But in reality, as we search the scriptures, spiritual warfare looks a lot more like what the KGB did during the Cold War. During the Cold War, uh, there was this huge campaign from the Soviet Union and and all the people that pulled the strings to flood the world with lies. And the best lies have have truth in them. So they were flooding the world with lies and half-truths and propaganda and placing high-level spies in key roles in Western media and journalism and entertainment. And you know what the goal was? It was to throw off the equilibrium of the West and it was to keep the folks in America and other and their allies like like searching for what's real. And what it did was it drained all the energy and the activity of the West and, and kept trying to keep the West chasing their tails. All the while, the goal was to keep secret what was going on behind the Iron Curtain. That is a good picture of the war on your peace. In my piece, that's a good picture of the battle that we find ourselves in. So there was this chess player, uh, Gary Kasparov. He's a Russian chess champion, exiled political guy in Russia. He, he describes that battle like this. The point of modern propaganda isn't only to misinform or push an agenda. It's to exhaust your critical thinking and annihilate truth. That that transposes very well onto the battle that you and I find ourselves in. The war on your peace is waged in the battlefield of your mind. Our real enemy is the devil, and the devil wants you to believe lies. 
We talked about that in last week's message. Please go and check it out on YouTube or wherever you download podcasts where we talked about for Jesus, the devil is real. And the devil's goal is to spread ruin in our souls and all over society. And it started way back in Genesis 3. And the devil's main method in this world that we live in to do battle is lies. Yeah, the Apostle Peter picks up on this idea. In uh, his uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 and 9, he, he encourages people to be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. So I've painted a bleak image of the battle that we're up against. It's lies and, and it's exhausting and all, all these, these different um, dynamics are going on. But there is good news to this. We don't have to be passive bystanders in this battle. Peter says, resist the devil and he will flee. The best news in this is that Jesus already did the heavy lifting all the lifting, really. Like, the battle is won. Jesus defeated death and hell and the grave. My friends, our role in this battle is to continually calibrate our minds and our hearts to the right map. The truth. Jesus is the truth. When you know the truth, you will be set free, like we were talking about a few minutes ago. So for the next few minutes, let's take a look and an example of what this battle looked like, looked like in the in the life of Jesus. So, um, as you're getting your Bibles ready, turn to cha uh, Luke chapter four, uh, just to set the story up. This happens right after Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. And they have this interaction at the at the edge of the river, and John the Baptist says, "Here comes God's chosen one." I'm paraphrasing here. Uh, John says, "You should baptize me," and Jesus says, "This is the way it's got to be." Uh, I'm obeying my heavenly father. John baptizes Jesus and the heavens part. And then there's this voice that says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And immediately there's a dove that lands on Jesus' head. It's this uh, moment, oh, kind of moment. And immediately Jesus goes into the wilderness for solitude, prayer, and meditation. And he's there for 40 days. And that's where our text picks up today. The devil comes to him in verse 1 of Luke chapter 4. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. For 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days. And at the end of them he was hungry. So the first point is, let's eat nothing for 40 more. I'm just kidding. I'm, uh, this is a description of what happened. But I want to point out here just, a, just a, a paradigm shift in my perspective when I read this text. I used to read this text as Jesus in the desert and hungry, and that's when the devil comes to him to tempt him. But my, my experience in following Jesus and practicing some of these, uh, these disciplines, I'm by no means an expert. I'm, I'm in process in this. But as Jesus is, is seeking, uh, is full of the Holy Spirit, this is when he's fully charged. This is when he's charged up and he's not depleted here. Has uh, something deep within him, deeper than, than physical hunger, is actually satisfied. And that's one of the reasons why he's able to battle the devil so effectively. And it continues on here in verse 3. The devil said to him, if you are the son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone. So the, the devil's coming to him with, these are lies stacked upon lies. Nothing has changed since Genesis 3. Uh, putting, putting a little bit of truth, but definitely trying to question God. Did God really say that? Is what the devil said to Adam and Eve. Here, here, uh, at, right after, a few verses after, we hear God saying, this is my son. We have the devil coming to Jesus saying, 
if you are really the son of God, if your identity is really who, who, what God said it is, turn these stones into bread. So there's a couple lies here. First is, is who are you really? And the second lie is, God isn't enough. I mean, you're hungry. Do something spectacular and turn these stones into bread. Look, 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 God's left you. The Spirit has literally led you into the wilderness. But you can turn these stones into bread. Then you'll have provisions. Because this world that we live in, there isn't enough. Maybe God won't provide for your needs. Uh, you are literally wrapped up in whatever you have. You, know, you don't have enough, Jesus, but the truth is what Jesus quotes back to him. God is more than enough. There is enough in this world, and God is enough to sustain even deeper things in my life than physical hunger. So the devil recalibrates and, and tries a different tactic. In verse five, the devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. So there's another lie here that the devil is trying to get Jesus to believe that this is all about what people say about you. You know, you've, you've been brought to the earth for a purpose. Maybe this is how God wanted it. Let me just take a little shortcut here. I'll give you all the authority. You can establish your kingdom right now. You won't have to suffer. You won't have to grind. You won't have to go through any heartache. Just take a shortcut. Here, here, you can have all these wonderful things said about you. But Jesus knew that the devil's a liar. And he had just been told, again, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Jesus knew that, that it, was, it was what God said about him needed to be more important or else he was setting himself up for failure. Now, maybe, maybe you've uh, done a presentation at work or worked really hard on a meal or maybe you've given a sermon in church like this and, and you could have people say wonderful things about it afterwards. Hey, good presentation, buddy. Oh, that... That casserole was wonderful, Francis. I, I'm just pulling this out of my head right now. Or, or after I get uh, off stage on Sunday morning, uh, oh, hey, good job on the sermon, Mike. Thanks, uh, I'm thinking about that. You could have a hundred of those, a hundred of those. But what if one person says, eh, I've had better, I've seen better, uh, kind of missed it on that sermon. Which one are you going to, to listen to? The, the hundred that said you did a good job or the one that said you didn't do a good job? Well, if your identity is not wrapped up in who God says you are, you're gonna not only remember that one piece of, hopefully it was constructive feedback or negative feedback, and that's when the devil sneaks in to have you ruminate on it and say, you know, that one person was right. Oh, I could have done better. And, and then it compounds on that, uh, I'm nothing, I'm just worthless. Oh, I've done this again and this is what I always do. And the lies start coming out of your mouth. Don't fall for that lie. Not only are you, you're not what you have, your possessions, you're not what people say about you. That does not determine your worth and value. Jesus knew that God's opinion was the most important. That's a truth you and I need to constantly remind ourselves of. When we turn control of our lives over to Jesus, we're trusting that our identity and our worth and value is more important, more important and, and, and more stable than just the opinion of others. God's opinion counts the most. So after these first two lies don't work, Satan recalibrates again. The devil comes at a different angle. In verse nine, the devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand at the highest point of the temple. Here's the lie again. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here for it's written in the Bible, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered, 
It is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. The lie here is, wow, imagine if you threw yourself off and everybody saw you falling and then the angels came and saved you. That would be spectacular. You are like, that would really make, then you've arrived. When people say, look what this guy can do. (laughs) This is amazing. And the truth is, don't put God to a test like that. The truth is, you're not what you do. You're just like you're not what people say about you, just like you're not the material possessions that you own or, or how much money you have in your bank account. The truth is, I'll try to say it another, another way, you matter because God says you matter. Jesus clung to that truth. You are my beloved son, Jesus. And no matter which angle the devil came at Jesus with, Jesus knew the truth. No matter how many scriptures the devil quoted, Jesus knew what the truth was. He knew what the whole truth was, not just a twisted half-truth. I love Luke chapter 4, verse 13. When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. Jesus' map, even through the wilderness and the testing and, and the alone time, Jesus' map was the truth. And the truth was what God said about him. These were not like spells to make the devil uh, run away. Maybe some of you are taking notes and you're a type A personality, so you're remembering, oh, which you're already checking the cross references. And okay, so Jesus said that in, in Deuteronomy. No, these aren't spells. Uh, the, the devil knew the scriptures too. This is Jesus reminding himself and declaring what the truth is, that you're not what you do. You're not the sum of your accomplishments. You are not what you have. You are much more significant than the things that you acquire. And you are not what people say about you. Your your reputation starts and begins with what God thinks about you. And the devil tried to twist this over and over, over again. So what in the world does this mean for us in 2022. So I want to point out here that Jesus was practicing spiritual disciplines and those gave him strength. Yes, he was the son of God. He was also human. He also left the comfort and safety of heaven, gave up all that comes with being God because he was humble and he was out in the wilderness practicing silence, practicing solitude and practicing prayer and fasting. And in my tradition, the, there was a, a, an emphasis on, on what you believe. And it is so good to believe the right things. And as I've grown older, I've, I've learned that you, we're, we're to pair right beliefs with good practices and not some sort of masochistic kind of torturing ourselves. We're meant to live in community. But these 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 practices that Jesus practiced, when we do what we see Jesus doing in the four gospels, like that's where our spiritual disciplines come from. And I mentioned them before. Some of them are solitude, silence, prayer, and fasting. That's the rule of thumb. So much of what we read about Jesus doing, like we can imitate it and not just read about it. So uh, we've had these lies, but I want to talk about what the truth is. Well, because What's true of Jesus here becomes true of us when we start following Jesus. Some people call it getting saved. Some people say when you turn control over your life to Jesus, when you become a Jesus follower, because of what Jesus has done, when God looks at you, he doesn't see your faults, doesn't see your sins, those are forgiven. And when he looks at you, when God thinks about you, He sees what Jesus has done. And because of Jesus, we are adopted into God's family. And the same thing is said about us. When God looks at you, he says, this is my beloved son. This is my beloved daughter. When you do that and follow Jesus, that just blows my mind that God says the same thing about you and that God is pleased with you. And what this does, it's like armor for our emotional health 
It can be. It can be armor that a lot of us don't, uh, we don't even access for our mind and our thoughts. Because if your identity is, is wrapped up in your accomplishments, uh, if it's wrapped up in what people say about you and, and, and how much money you have or how many possessions you have, then your, your concept of yourself is gonna go up based on your performance, your reputation, or your bank account, or it's going to go down. And you wind up living your life on this zigzag. But God didn't say, this is my beloved son because he got all the trophies and, and performs well on his yearly uh, performance review. No, no, because you follow Jesus. This is my beloved son. God doesn't say, this is my beloved daughter because everyone in the neighborhood knows that she really has it going on and has her house in order and she's a, a leader and a great mom and, and looks good doing it too. No, Jesus says, this is my beloved daughter in whom I'm well pleased based on what God says about you. Same thing for your possessions. So reminding of yourself of this truth is the main way to fight the devil. Guys, I have to remind myself of this truth on a daily basis, multiple times a day. It can seem really basic, but we never graduate from this practice of reminding ourselves of who we belong to, who we and, and, and who we are because of who we belong to. So remind yourself of whose you are and who who you who you are. <laughs> it's a lot of who's. And last week I talked about turning the channel. That's easier said than done. When we have these thoughts that are more than thoughts, when we find ourselves in the same crazy cycle over and over again, this is how we turn the channel. We remind ourselves over and over again of what God says about us. And this week I wanna continue encouraging you to turn the channel. Now this is the challenge for us from this text. Guys, it's time to clean house and, and take these thoughts that, that we keep rehearsing, uh, analyze these cycles that we find ourselves in of pride and then, and then reverse pride of thinking nothing of ourselves. Like let's take an inventory of what we're letting into our minds. I've been doing this myself, taking a look at my next Netflix history, my YouTube history, what I've been looking like, is it, uh, I'm good with the basics, you know, basic ratings and avoiding the stuff everyone knows you should avoid, but I'm also looking at stuff that sometimes we, we, uh, we say, oh, it's okay, it's really a popular show, I wanna be culturally relevant, but I wanna take a look at what, what is this entertainment really saying? What is this artist trying to say? Is what they're saying true? Is it filled with violence? Is it filled with, is it propping up a lifestyle that's contrary to God's, to God's kingdom and the way God's kingdom works? If it is, we need to be careful about letting all that junk into our minds and hearts because it's sneaky. If we, if we keep doing it and saying, well, now this is, it, it can normalize patterns that, that are painful and destructive for us and for the people in our lives. Um, one way that, that we consistently need to clear out the, the, the channel in our minds and the junk in our minds is watching our news. And I'm not picking on one news source. All, I'll just lump them all in together, offend everybody at the same time. All cable news, like be careful with this. I'm saying this not with a pointed finger, but like metaphorically on my knees. Please be careful with orienting yourself and making your map of what truth is by news. And I'm not saying don't be informed, but you can be informed without having a talking head droning in your living room or bedroom for hours and hours on end, telling you all the different ways the world could destroy, telling you all the different people that you should be hate, that, that you should hate. Be informed, be a good citizen, pray for the leaders, pray for the wars of our world, pray for all the dysfunction that's out there for sure, but be careful about using your news as a map to navigate life. Because the only pure truth we have is Jesus' example and Jesus as revealed in the scripture. And take a note, maybe for you it's, it's binge watching shows, maybe for you it's binge watching 
cable news or whatever it is. Just notice the time you spend putting those things in your heart versus putting the truth in your heart. Maybe for us, it's, it's reversing our priorities a little bit and, and giving more space and more, more room in our, in our minds and hearts to actually hear what God says about us. And it will give us a better map to know how to, how to be in this world and how to act in this world. I've seen too many people taken out by, by whether it's ignorance or a choice of keeping their channels tuned in to what the world is telling them through entertainment, through news, through media, or whatever. Too many families and friendships have been ripped apart by especially using the news as their map to navigate through the real world. I, I know of, of people who don't talk to their own family members because one's chosen this news outlet and one's chosen, chosen another. Like that's not the heart of God. So as we're cleaning house this week, I wanna challenge you again to turn down the noise and that includes social media. I'm stealing this idea from Pastor Ryan. He, he, uh, he started over about, I don't know, six, eight months ago of, of engaging more than consuming. So having a good dialogue with someone, okay, that's a, someone posts a, a, a picture of what they're having for dinner. What's your recipe? What are you doing tonight? He'll comment on it. So engaging and creating doesn't necessarily mean that you're posting all the time, but really leveraging those things to actually connect with somebody or to ask them a question about what they post and not just mindlessly scrolling uh, over and over for hours and hours. Like use, we have all these tools and it's great that we can be informed, but let's use them for good and not evil. It's not all bad, the media. I'm glad for, for media and all the access we have to the world. I'm not getting on a soapbox box saying that we need to bunker ourselves away from, from all the, the influences in our culture. And I wanna be as relevant culturally as the next person but let's take a serious inventory of what the noise in our culture is telling us about our worth and our value. So guys, let's, let's fight the devil this week. Let's, let's take an active role in winning our peace back. And here's how. Following Jesus' example. Now listen real close. Find a quiet place this week. Pray and read scripture. <laughs> It's just that simple. <laughs> Turn down the noise in our culture. Talk to God about whatever you're anxious about. Talk to God about the problems you're facing. Talk to God about habits, whatever, and pray. That's our role. We don't have to, 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 to psych ourselves up and slap ourselves in the face or, or to, to find some sort of hack. Like, let's quiet ourselves so that we can hear what God is saying. Hear that voice saying, you are my beloved son. I've got you. You are my beloved daughter. I see you and you matter. And I, I, I highly suggest that you join, uh, join us at Solid Ground in reading this devotional plan that's linked on our website. Uh, a devotional plan that uh, is from the book that inspired a lot of these messages and inspired the, the, the messages that are going to follow in the next couple weeks. It's called Live No Lies. And for seven days, maybe for you, if you don't know where to start, that's a great place to start as you read through Scripture and ask God to, to reorient your, yourself to the truth. That's it. It's simpler than you probably thought, but that's our role in the battle. Get quiet. Talk to God and read scripture. It's not complicated, but it's, it's super hard. It's difficult enough. It's not rocket science. It's just really hard to turn down the noise of the world and start listening to God. And I wanted to give us some space here while we're still together. Let's practice this. Just take a couple deep breaths and let them out. Ask God to open your ears and open your heart. And I want to read the scripture prayerfully over you. As you, uh, maybe, maybe for you, you just need to turn your palms over and say, God, take these burdens, take my worries, my anxiety, whatever it is that's holding you back right now in your life or in your relationship with God. And now I invite you to close your eyes and listen to the scripture found in Philippians chapter four. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, 
Rejoice! Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. So this week, as you go back out into the world, as you log off whatever device you're, you're watching on, I want to say a blessing over you. May the God of the angel armies bless you and keep you and do battle for you as you turn down the noise of this world. May you hear God calling you his beloved son or his beloved daughter. And this week, may you sense God giving you his peace. In the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit, amen. God bless you and we'll see you real soon.